Welcome to 1976, a time when things generally made more sense. All right, here we are back in 1976. This is the 10th episode of my trip through music. All right, I'm not going to list out a ton of also rans from this year. I'm just going to hit some of the bigger albums that came out because this could potentially be long. All right, first up, <clears throat> January 6th, double album, live album, Peter Frampton, Frampton Comes Alive. A lot of people... Uh, tend to list this one as one of their favorite live albums ever. Um, it was recorded in, I believe, three different locations. There was, a, there was a show in San Francisco that was recorded. There was a show in New York. And third location, I'm not remembering. Possibly in Florida. But, <clears throat> and, and this is a, a great album, no doubt. There's um, some serious highlights on this album. But there are a few on this album that are really not very strong at all. And there are a few on this album where I find the production value slipped for some strange reason. It's like the there's something with the drums on this album that um, bothers me. Some points they're way too loud, and some points they're not loud enough. There's no separation. There's, and they had recording equipment and technology at the time that that could have overlooked that. But so with that said, there's some really great stuff on here. Some of his hits, I mean, quite a few of them at that time. Show me the way. All I want to be is by your side. Is kind of a highlight. That's a great song. Baby, I Love Your Way. I'll Give You Money. That's an interesting song. Their version of Jumpin' Jack Flash is unique, if nothing else. Um, not, not my favorite take on that particular song, but I give them credit. They, they try to do it their own way. And side four of this album is Lines on My Face and then a almost 15 minute version of um, Do You Feel Like We Do and that track is the standout on this album because <clears throat> it's got all the talk box stuff on it Do You Feel Like I Do all that stuff is cool but the solo that follows that is just classic Peter Frampton and he's a, he's a really really good guitar player um, especially from this point forward he grew in his guitar playing quite a bit and I have I wouldn't say I've studied some of his stuff but I've dug into it pretty deep and there's a lot going on in it. it's not just you know rock and roll boogie woogie stuff there's a lot going on in his playing and some of it came out on this album but a lot of it came really later but <clears throat> anyway Frampton Comes Alive, fantastic live album. Um, like I said, it's the one that a lot of people put up there as the pinnacle to be judged by. David Bowie came out with Station to Station. This was the start of his Thin White Duke era. It was also the start of his Hey, Drugs Are Cool era. Uh, this is one of his most critically acclaimed albums, I guess. He's got about four of them that get some really good marks from the critics, but this is one of them. It's got Golden Years on it. Uh, what else has it got? Station to Station. Yeah, it's it's got some interesting stuff on it. No, nothing that a lot of people remember very much besides Golden Years, unfortunately. Because there's some good stuff on there. Uh, oddly enough, David Bowie said he didn't remember any of this stuff because he was so whacked out when he did it. But what are you going to do? 
So yeah, you got Station to Station by David Bowie. Next big album that came out this year to me. Bad Company, Run With The Pack. Had some good stuff on it, but uh, kind of a letdown to their previous albums for me. Just a little bit. Skinner came out with Gimme Back My Bullets, the fourth album. Uh, this one had that song on it. It has some stuff that's kind of buried in their catalog, um, but there's some really good stuff on here. Every Mother's Son, Trust, a J.J. Kale song, I Got the Same Old Blues, Double Trouble, Roll Gypsy Roll, Searching, probably my favorite song on that, that album, uh, Cry for the Bad Man, and All I Can Do is Write About It. Another great song. It's... Um, the ones that kind of slip under people's radar from that album that I really like. Uh, they would also put a live album out this year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but yeah, that's a good album. Genesis, the first instance of Genesis without Peter Gabriel in the band. So it's just the four of them. Um, Phil Collins, Peter Banks... Mike Rutherford and Steve Hackett on guitar and a lot of people thought Genesis was dead when when Peter Gabriel left and this album definitely proved them wrong Trick of the Tale it's um, mostly still of that progressive vein they hadn't come close to going pop mainstream yet on this album one of the highlights on this album to me is the song Dance on a Volcano. It's got this intro guitar thing on it that's just... It's off-kilter enough that you you don't... It's one of those kind of things where you feel like you know what's about to be played sometimes, and then it's completely different. Um, it has that kind of a feel to it. It's got this little guitar thing at the, the start of it that bounces around from... You know, instead of playing the same thing four times in a row and then going into another movement, it, it's like it picks and chooses from that little riff what it does on the follow-up riffs. And um, I really enjoy that song. I really enjoy it. This whole album, though, is really good. Dance on a Volcano, Entangled, Squonk, Madman Moon, Robbery, Assault, and Battery, Ripples, A Trick of the Tale, and Los Endos. Genesis, A Trick of the Tale. Definitely a great album. Um, the highest selling greatest hits album that was ever put out was released this year. That was the Eagles, their greatest hits, 71 to 75. It took a few years to become the highest selling album, but anyway, that came out this year, and it is a, that's fantastic place to go if you don't know what Eagles to listen to. Very good album. Okay, also this year we had the Doobie Brothers Taking It to the Streets where Michael McDonald became very much a part of them. Also Jeff Skunk Baxter on guitar became very very much uh, a part of that group. The music on it is outstanding. I just can't stand Michael McDonald singing. But there's some great songs on it. I mean, you don't have to enjoy the guy's voice to understand that there's some good music on that album. All right, Wings put out Speed of the Sound. I think that had uh, Let Him In, maybe Listen to What the Man Said. I don't remember if that one's on there or not. It was an okay album. Uh, there was a lot of stuff on this album. Paul McCartney had been accused, if you will, of Wings being just a, a vehicle for Paul McCartney's solo. So he made this much more of an album effort. Uh, everybody in the band was singing, everybody was writing songs, and I think it, it may have been better if it had been more of a Paul McCartney effort, in my opinion, but it's still okay. They did put out a live album this year that was fantastic. Thin Lizzy put out an album called Jailbreak. This is one of those albums, 
I'm sure you've heard a couple of songs off of it. Most people have heard Jailbreak, more than likely. Most people have heard The Boys Are Back in Town. Some people have probably heard the Cowboy song. You need to go listen to this album. This was, to me, this was the pinnacle of Thin Lizzy. Finally getting to it, Carl. <laughs> this album is just a knockout. It had... Um, Brian Downey and Robbo Robertson playing guitar on it, and I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Scott Gorham and Robertson playing guitar. And those two together, those two by themselves are great guitar players, two fantastic guitar players. Put them together, they can do some magic things. The way they put themselves together in Thin Lizzy over a period of a few albums was just spectacular. Um, if you want, if you don't want to go listen to everything on this album to see if I know what I'm talking about or not, go listen to the song Warriors. It's got a couple of solos in it that will absolutely flip your boat over. Uh, but the whole album, the entire album, it's classic Thin Lizzy. It's got the hard stuff on it. It's got the upbeat stuff. It's got kind of the laid back, interesting stuff on it. Uh, but from top to bottom, it's just a great album. And then the thing that drives it to me are the twin guitars on this album. Um, not taking anything away from Phil Lynott, the bass player, singer, soul of the band. He, he definitely had a lot to do with it. But those two guys just slay me on this album. There you go, Carl. I, I told you I love the band. I just... Hadn't really gotten into them a whole lot other than a here and there. All right. Also this year, Kiss came out with Destroyer. Uh, great album. Great album. Uh, like I said on the the other album that's between this and um, their second album that I really struggle with, but and their first album for that matter. But this one's got popular songs on it: are "Shout It Out Loud," "God of Thunder," uh, "Detroit Rock City," "Beth." Those are the ones most people think of, but it's the ones in between those that are really the cool part of this album: "King of the Nighttime World," "Great Expectations," "Flaming Youth," "Sweet Pain." Do You Love Me? Uh, it's just some great stuff on this album. It's a, a fantastic album. And it's got a cool album cover as well. But yeah, Kiss Destroyer definitely holds a special place in my heart. It was um, one of the earlier albums that I bought. It wasn't the first, but it was one of the early ones that I bought. I remember buying it at Murphy's Mart. And... Uh, just listen to it endlessly for a number of years it was fantastic and I can still listen to it to this day and enjoy it, it it's got some stay in power for me Judas Priest came out with the sad wings of destiny it's, uh, I think this is a really good album there are some things on it that I just don't like at all some uh, not necessarily songs but some portions of this album that I just don't like at all. Uh, I think they did much better in a few years to come. But Sad Sad Wings of Destiny is something you should probably listen to if you've never listened to early Judas Priest. If nothing else, to hear him scream, man. Let's see, Led Zeppelin came out with Presence, the one they called A Quick One. This album is probably the closest thing to progressive rock they ever came. It's um, it's interesting. Not my favorite album by then, but I can listen to it, you know, often enough to be reminded of, of what I do like about it. Sorry, Mike, I know you don't care for it, but it's got some interesting, it's got some different stuff. It's a different sound from Led Zeppelin. And... Yeah, you can tell it's probably not going to be my favorite one from this year, just from that glowing review, but... 
from Boz Skaggs put out Silk Degrees. I listened to this album many, many times when I was young. My brother had this on vinyl. Uh, this was his seventh album. Uh, it's got the big songs on it are Lowdown, Lido Shuffle, and one of the songs he wrote called We're All Alone. He wrote those other two as well, but uh, We're All Alone became popular, became a huge hit for Rita Coolidge a few years after this. But Boz Skaggs, man, his voice, I don't know what it is about his voice that I love so much, because it's not really a great voice, it's just got that sound that, you know, I can't explain it, but so that's a good album. Boz Skaggs, Silk Degrees. Rush came out with 2112. This was um, kind of an answer to their record company because sales of those last two albums have been, you know. Record company wanted something more like their first album, which was just straightforward rock and roll kind of stuff. Rush said, okay. Went in the studio and made 2112. So here you go. <laughs> Straightforward rock and roll. About a 20 piece, 20 minute piece uh, song on one side of the album. Uh, this is a monumental album for me and for a lot of uh, musicians out there. It's just stunning the stuff that's on this album. You've got the 2112 suite, if you want to call it that. It's like a seven piece story of a dystopian future where this person finds an old guitar in a cave like an old artifact and tries to bring it back to society and the the overlords of the day don't won't have it and uh, it's a it's a cool story but there's some killer playing on that song i mean it's it's right up there with the best stuff they've ever done to me uh, I would have a really hard time picking between this album and moving pictures. It's it's there for me. Then on side two, after you get through with that big opus, you've got a passage to Bangkok, the Twilight Zone, Lessons, Tears, Something for Nothing, and every single song on this side, musically, lyrically, uh, performance-wise, everything is just top-notch. There is one thing on this that, that always just intrigued the hell out of me. A song called The Twilight Zone. Um, there, there's two things in it I'll talk about. So there's one portion where he's singing and he's doubling his voice, but instead of doing it with a singing voice, it's done with a whisper. And if you're not paying attention, that can slide by you. But if you listen really close, you can hear the lyrics of this song being whispered alongside his singing voice. But there's a point in here where it's got some really mellow guitars. Um, and then all of a sudden this yeah, Alex Lyson comes in with this big, you know, electric guitar stab, kind of a high note thing. And that happens a couple of times in the song, but there's one chorus where he comes in about a half a bar too quick. You hear him go boop and then stop. It's like he figured it out right as he hit the string. And then comes back in when he's supposed to come in. But it's just this little tiny beep. And I often wondered, and I've tried to, to research this, I never could find anything that any of them said about it. I heard them talk about the song quite a few times, but not that little thing. I get the feeling that he messed up he had his timing wrong. He did that. And the sense of humor in this band is pretty up there. And I think they laughed at him and thought it was so funny that they decided to leave it in there as a joke. That's what I believe about that little thing. And I believe it's, uh, he probably went along with it, just like laughing his butt off too. Anyway, 2112. Can't say enough about that album. It's absolutely bombastic. All right.
Also this year we had Black and Blue from the Rolling Stones, kind of a return to, I guess, normalcy for them after um, Mick Taylor quit. Most of this album is is Keith Richards on guitar. Ron Wood really hadn't gotten into the band yet. They were still they actually used the recording of this album as as auditions for the next guitar player so there were quite a few different people on there but probably the song on here that you've heard more than any other is fool to cry um, not one of their standout albums to me all right after that we've got <clears throat> A debut album from a band that would go on to influence a lot of other bands and most of them I didn't care for but this particular one I did that's the Ramones they put out their debut album this year and it was just like this psychotic in your face you know minute and a half songs two minute songs tops on most of them just this flurry of music that was unlike anything that had come before it and really unlike anything that came since and it was just a phenomenally influential album for punk rock it was really the first first what most people would consider punk rock album and I tend to agree with that um, yeah I've listened to that many times so there's some fun fun stuff on there ACDC put out their international debut with High Voltage, which had already come out in Australia, and so had another album. And they finally released it internationally, and it was a combination of those first two Australian albums, which made this one really strong. It's a long way to the top. Rock and roll singer, The Jack, Livewire, TNT, Can I Sit Next to You, Little Lover, She's Got Balls, and High Voltage. Uh, just a, it, it's not really a debut album, but it's the closest thing to a debut album we ever got internationally, other than, than imports and stuff like that. And it's a, it's a monster album, definitely. All right, also this year, Aerosmith came out with an, an album called Rocks. This is my personal favorite Aerosmith album. Um, just raw and rocking, and some great songs on this album. Back in the Saddle, Last Child, Rats in the Cellar, Combination, Sick as a Dog, Nobody's Fault, Get the Lead Out, Lickin' a Promise, and Home Tonight. And that album, from top to bottom, just hooks me. I can listen to it over and over again. I have I have driven for hours and listened to nothing but that album, just on repeat. It's really, really good Aerosmith to me. Like I said, it's my favorite Aerosmith. So there's that. Warren Zivon's debut, real debut album came out. The first one was kind of an anomaly what, seven years ago. This one had a who's who of rock and roll playing on it behind him. He had literally everybody playing in, in this during the recording of this album. And kind of returning the favor to him because he had been on everybody's albums over, you know, in the last four or five years. Big studio musician. Um, I can't say enough about Warren Zivon. He's one of my favorite entertainers ever. And everything he did is quirky, odd, groovy, cool, enjoyable, fun, humorous, sad. I mean, it's just got all this stuff in it. And um, I, I just love his stuff. And that was the first real instance where we saw his abilities come forward. Uh, anybody looking for some more cowbell? Blue Oyster Cult came out with Agents of Fortune. 
which had some cowbell on it. Good rocking album. Steve Miller Band came out with Fly Like an Eagle. They finally transformed from, I wouldn't say finally, said they, they eventually transformed from more of a blues outfit into a pop-based rock kind of stuff, and this was the start of that, really. Had that, that spacey intro into Fly Like an Eagle, Wild Mountain Honey, Dance, 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 Mercury Blues, Take the Money and Run, Rockin' Me, Sam Cooke song on there. Cheech and Chong shows up on this album. <laughs> Look it up. But yeah, that's a good 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 choice from um, Steve Miller Band. If you don't want to listen to his greatest hits, that one's pretty close to it. Steely Dan put out the Royal Scam. This was the album. This was two albums after they had kind of broken up the band and just started using studio musicians. This is the first one that Jeff Skunk Baxter wasn't a part of, really. And uh, he, they brought in some other players on this album, though, that were just monstrous guitar players. Uh, you had. Denny Diaz, of course, has on, been on several of them. Larry Carlton, Dean Parks, Elliot Randall. Uh, just some killer, killer players on this album. Uh, this one's probably most notably known for Kid Charlemagne. The Royal Scam is on here. Some great guitar playing on that album. There's great stuff on every album they ever did, though. All right. <clears throat> Jeff Beck put out his second solo album which was called Wired and it along with the previous album are my favorite stuff that he ever did uh, this one has Lead Boots Come Dancing Goodbye Pork Pie Hat Head for Backstage Pass Blue Wind Sophie Play With Me and Love Is Green a lot of this was written by Narada Michael Walton Max Middleton, Jan Hammer. But yeah, the bulk of it was written by Walden. But it's just got some stellar Jeff Beck playing on it, along with the other instrumentalists. Just some great stuff. All right. We've got another debut from a band. We had the bombastic Ramones debut album came out this year. ACDC's international debut album came out this year. Um, a band from Boston called Boston's debut album came out this year. This one often is up toward the top of the charts in in the best live, best first albums to ever come out kind of lists. Uh, rightfully so. This out, this is one of those albums that you've heard every song on it a million times, and for me, they never get old. They just never get old. I can't tell you how many times I've heard these songs on the radio, on CD, on cassette. No, I don't think I ever owned this particular album. I did own Don't Look Back on album, but not this one. Um, it's just a monstrous album. Tom Scholes is an absolute genius. One of the best studio wizards ever. As far as getting sounds, uh, mixing, layering stuff, doing stuff with the audio, making stuff go here and there, and double track and triple track and quadra track and whatever you name it, just some get some huge sounds on this album. Couldn't get the sounds he wanted out of an amplifier, so he invented the rock man, and that's that Boston sound, and. I've played through one of those things before, and it you can't play anything on guitar through one of those things and not sound like Boston. It's an amazing little box. But, um, yeah, he's just a, a, a genius, musical genius. And then you've got the playing on the album. Brad Delp's incredible singing on every single song. Harmonies all over the place. It's just a great album. 
literally one of the best debut albums ever. Um, it would be hard to not put that on just about any top five list of first albums. Also this year, this one's not really up for consideration because of the style of the music it is. It's This is more of a rock thing, right? Uh, a debut album by a fellow named Jocko Pastorius came out. Now you want to hear some incredible playing, specifically bass playing, go listen to Jocko Pastorius' first album. Uh, or literally go listen to anything he ever played on. But my goodness... Just a phenomenal player. Phenomenal. Right. Electric Light Orchestra put out a New World Record, which is one of the most fantastically named albums ever. A New World Record had Telephone Line which I rather enjoy. Living Thing, Do Ya, Shangri-La, So Fun, Rock, Rock Area, some other songs on there. Uh, really, really good ELO album. I think their best was still yet to come, but that was a good one. That was a really good one. There's another album I had when I was a child. I just saw it on the list and hadn't really thought about it. Al Stewart, Year of the Cat. Um... It's a smooth album. Al Stewart had some talent. Not my favorite album of the year, but I listened to it many, many times. I had that and Time Passages. Leonard Skinner put another album out this year called One More From The Road. Their live album. And it's a monster. It's This is really, I think, Skinner at quite honestly, at their their creative peak, I think they would get a re-energization, re what's the word I'm looking for? They would become re-energized when Steve Gaines joined the band, but this, this was great, working for MCA, I Ain't the One, Searching, Tuesday's Gone, Saturday Night Special, Traveling Man, Whiskey Rocker Roller. Uh, Sweet Home, Give Me Three Steps, Call Me the Breeze, Tea for Texas, Needle in the Spoon, Crossroads, and Freebird. And it's just a, a monster of an album. It's fantastic. So we've got two things from Skinner this year, which is never a bad thing. I think that's the only time that ever happened. All right, we had another one from ACDC. This was an Australia release. Uh, it would come out later internationally, uh, like five years later in the US, but Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. Uh, what a great album. And this has potentially one of my, definitely one of my favorite ACDC songs on it, but it's got uh, Dirty Deeds, Ain't No Fun, Problem Child, Squealer, Big Balls, Jailbreak, and it's got the immaculate Ride On on it. What a great song. Um, just a fantastic album from top to bottom. Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. As good as the stuff was that came out after Bon Scott died, those first albums were just stellar. Sabbath came out with Technical Ecstasy. They were starting to kind of become less popular at this time. I think they were far more popular up through their first four albums, maybe even their fifth. Uh, but this one has some good stuff on it. it has some really good stuff on it. Backstreet Kids, You Won't Change Me, It's Alright, Gypsy, uh, Rock and Roll Doctor, She's Gone. It's, it's got some good stuff on it. But they were they were winding down their time with one another. They were getting tired of one another. Or tired of Ozzy, I don't know which it was. But things would change 
not too long for them. Stevie Wonder put out Songs in the Key of Life. Uh, do yourself a favor and go listen to that album. It, it will absolutely blow your mind. There's some great stuff on that album. Songs in the Key of Life from Stevie Wonder. We had that LP and listened to it many, many times when I was younger. It is just great, great album. Rush put out a live album. They usually put out an, a live album at the end of kind of an era of themselves. And then the following two or three, sometimes four albums would be kind of a stylistic change. And they would put another live album out. And they would go through that pretty much their whole career. <clears throat> well, this was the first live one they put out. It's called All the World's a Stage. And it has stuff off of their first three albums, first four albums on it. Uh, Bastille Day, Anthem, Fly By Night, In The Mood, Something For Nothing, Lakeside Park, 2112 in its entirety, uh, By Tour and the Snow Dog, In The End, Working Man, Finding My Way, What You're Doing. It's a really, really good live album. It's a really good representation of what yeah, of what Rush sounded like live. Uh, and I, I saw them several times, and they pulled off some stuff live that you you wouldn't think they would be able to do, but they did. They were a great live band. All right, Styx put out Crystal Ball. Uh, this was the era of Styx that I really enjoyed. Uh, Equinox, Crystal Ball, Grand Illusion, Pieces of Eight. This one had... Mademoiselle, Crystal Ball, Claire de Lune, This Old Man, Put Me On, uh, really, really good album, really good album. Crystal Ball alone is enough to, to hold my interest on that album. Kansas, Kansas put out their fourth album called Left Overture. This has the phenomenal pinnacle of rock songs on it, in my opinion. One of the few, one of the few that, when I think of of best well constructed songs, this is one of them. Carry on, Wayward Son. Just an absolute great song. The Wall. Miracles out of nowhere. A Cheyenne anthem. Magnum opus. The songs got, I mean, this album's got some great stuff on it. Uh, Carry On Wayward Son is, is worth the price of admission. That song, when it comes on the radio, I stop what I'm doing. I, you know, it's, it's one of those songs that I know every little detail of it when I'm listening to it. Actually, I'll tell you a funny story about that really quickly. <laughs> I had to have an MRI done once before one of my surgeries. You're in there for like 30 minutes, and it's incredibly loud. And one of the technicians there said, "Try to try to think of something, anything in your mind that you can, you know, take your mind off of the sound and the fact that you have to be laying absolutely still for half an hour and all this." I went through that song in my mind, quite literally note for note, section for section, and recreated that song in my mind. I, I knew it well enough to be able to to at least believe that I got the whole thing right in my head. Whether I did or not, I don't know, but sure felt like it. I also went over Hotel California. But yeah, so if you ever have an MRI, try to do something like that. Seeger put out Night Moves, another great Seeger album. Half of it was recorded at Muscle Shoals Sound. Uh, really, really good stuff. Love Seeger. Love the Muscle Shoals guys. They have a special place in my heart. Another debut album. <clears throat> this time from, um, from one of my favorite bands, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Um, I sure do miss Tom. I really, re really, really wish... Tom was still around, but 
He left us with some great music and some great memories, that's for sure. Or he did me, anyway. This one has, um, among others, Breakdown, Anything That's Rock and Roll, American Girl. It's got some good stuff on there. It's classic Tom Petty. Classic stuff on there. Yep, I sure do miss Tom. Kiss also came out with Rock and Roll Over this year. I meant to bring my 8-track tape of that out here with me, but I forgot. I may tack that onto the end of this video. We'll see. Kiss Rock and Roll Over. It's their fifth album, studio album. It had some good stuff on it. I Want You, Call Him Dr. Love, Ladies Room, See You in Your Dreams, Interesting Thing from Simmons, Hard Luck Woman, Making Love. Had some rockers on it, man. It was a good album. Rock and Roll Over. That's why I still have it on 8-track. Just in case I ever get another 8-track player, I'll have something to listen to. ZZ Top came out with Tejas. I believe this is their fifth album. Yep. Tejas has It's Only Love. Arrested for Driving While Blind, El Diablo, Snappy Khaki, uh, Enjoy and Get It On. Second half of this album has stuff that unless you own this album, you probably never heard it. Ten Dollar Man, Pan Am Highway Blues, Avalon Hideaway, She's a Heartbreaker, and A Sleep in the Desert. Instrumental from Billy Gibbons. It's another ZZ Top album. Uh, like I said, those first six, I, there's nothing on them that I don't like. They're just really, really good, fun music. All right, <clears throat> another big one from this year, Hotel California by the Eagles. This is the era where most people really start getting into the Eagles. It's the era where I started fading from them. I really love the original incarnation of that band with Bernie Leadon, Randy Meisner, Don Henley, and Glenn Fry. That four-piece outfit was the pinnacle of the Eagles. When they added Don Felder, they still put out some good stuff. When they got rid of Bernie and eventually Randy and, and replaced them with Joe Walsh and Timothy B. Schmidt, they still made some great music, but it's not the same kind of music that I fell in love with with the Eagles. Um, Hotel California is kind of a mix between those two things to me. Uh, yeah, it's some good stuff on it. Like I say, I'm not saying it's not a good album. It's just not my favorite stuff from the Eagles. It's got Hotel California, New Kid in Town. It does have Life in the Fast Lane. Wasted Time, Victim of Love, Try and Love Again. That's a great one by Randy Meisner. And The Last Resort, Pretty Maids All in a Row. But yeah, the, there's some stuff on there that I'm like, eh, I can skip that. And there's some stuff on there like Hotel California. When I'm having an MRI done, I can go through the whole thing in my head. Uh, there is some, there's a funny story I wanted to tell I forgot. Steely Dan's album that came out this year there's a line in one of the songs that says uh, turn up the eagles that the neighbors can hear us and that was a, a line that was written in reference to Donald uh, Walter Becker I'm sorry Walter Becker was having a, an argument or something with his wife or girlfriend or something like that and she was a big Eagles fan and he hated it he's like Big Lebowski I hate the Eagles man but anyway uh, they put that line in there turn up the Eagles the neighbors can hear us ostensibly to drown out their arguing and the Eagles were kind of friendly with these guys they, they had knew each other and they thought it was funny. So there's a line in this album that's a reference to Steely Dan. Do you know what it is? I had heard it a million times 
And I'd heard the Steely Dan album a million times and I never put two and two together. So it's that line in Hotel California. Stab it with their steely knives, but they just can't kill the beast. That's a commonly misheard lyric is stab it with their steely eyes. Stab it with their steely eyes, but they actually say steely knives. They just can't kill the beast. That was a reference to Steely Dan, kind of as a joke back to them. And those two things together, I find amusingly enjoying. I love stuff like that when bands do things like that. All right. Uh, the day after Hotel California came out, A Day at the Races from Queen came out. Uh, some people consider this like part two of um, A Night at the Opera. Uh, it's a great album. Great album. Tie Your Mother Down. Killer Rocker from Brian May. Take My Breath Away. Long Away. The Millionaire Waltz. You and I. Written by the bass player, which is a rarity for them. Somebody to Love. is on there. There's Roger, a couple of Roger Taylor songs on there. Uh, one Roger Taylor sung, singing on, on one of these, on a, a song called Drowse. But yeah, it's not quite a night at the opera for me, but it's a great album too. The Day at the Races. All right. That same day, Wings put out Wings Over America which is a triple live LP. I had this thing as a kid, and I listened to it so many times. And I listened to it a couple of days ago just to kind of refresh myself about it, and I absolutely adored this album as a kid. And there's some good stuff on there, but it didn't hold up. It didn't hold up for me. The, the parts of it that are not great are, are not even what I would call good enough in some instances. There's just some flat spots through there. So overall, it didn't hold up for me. But I sure did enjoy it when I was a kid. I thoroughly enjoyed it when I was a kid. Genesis put out a second album this year, Wind and Weathering. Another good album by them. Um, I still prefer the stuff they did with Peter Gabriel. But they put out some good stuff as a four-piece unit. And they put out a few good things as a three-piece unit, but when they started changing to pop and the Phil Collins show, they lost me. Here's another good debut album. Blondie came out this year. Um, I've always enjoyed Blondie. Always have, always will. I wouldn't call it an extremely strong album or anything like that, but there's some good stuff on there. All right. One other album I want to mention is by Ry Cooter. You've heard me mention him before. It's called Chicken Skin Music. Um, go give that one a listen. It's It's got some laid back, uh, boogie, soul, rhythm and blues, New Orleans, um, Mexican sounding stuff on it. Very well put together, if you ask me. There's some great songs on that album. Uh, go give that one a listen and see if you like it. If you do, there, there's a lot of other stuff by Ry Cooter out there that you'll probably like. Chicken Skin Music. All right, so there you have the contenders. Um, like I said, there were some seriously good albums that came out this year. Some really, really good stuff. Sorry, Phil, I skipped over the opera. You're probably not watching at this point anyway, are you? Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? This album is not one of those albums that I can listen to over and over again, like Aerosmith Rocks or Steely Dan or the Stevie Wonder album or Hotel California or Boston 
any number of these great albums that came out this year. There was some really good stuff. This album, I can't do that with because it hits me so hard that I have to have a break after I listen to it. I literally, at some points in this album, I literally find myself going, it's, it's that good to me. It is a phenomenally written album, a phenomenally played album. Getty Lee finally figured out how to sing Neil Peart's vocals over their complex music. The solos, the guitar solos on this album are all outstanding. The bass playing, everything about it musically is just phenomenal. The songs themselves on side two, I mean, never mind 2112 being what it is, but the songs on side two, if the whole album had been those kind of songs, I think it would have been a great album. Uh, but there's some seriously good stuff on there. Some some great rocking, some ballad stuff, some ethereal stuff on there uh, it's just uh, can't say enough about this album I remember the first time I ever heard it I was at a friend of mine's um, what do you call it dorm apartment dorm he was in college and uh, that's what I was trying to say and he says hey have you ever heard 2112 we were talking about Rush or something you know, I'd said, you know, Tom Sawyer or something like that. I'd probably never heard a whole lot from Rush. This was in the early 80s. And he goes, you ever heard 2112? I'm like, and he pulls out this huge album, you know, this big fold-out album with all these lyrics and all this story printed in it and all this stuff. I was like, what is this? He threw it on and started playing it. And I think we probably listened to it two or three times that day. And I'm sitting here reading all the stuff in it. And it's just, a, it's one of those classic albums that had all these great liner notes and all this stuff in it. And um, I was absolutely hooked. Went out and bought the CD. Uh, eventually became a, a huge Rush fan and bought their entire catalog. I don't think they have any that I've never owned. But that was the, the album that really got me into Rush. And it, it definitely holds a special place for me. And like I said, I listened to it just yesterday. And um, sitting here on the porch, just had it cranked all the way up. Probably ticking my neighbors off. But man, I got through and just sat here. Smoked a pipe for about 15 minutes. Just sat here reflecting on that. It's a, a stunning album. So there you have my best for 1976. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think I'm going to pick in 1977. This was the 10th one. We made it through 10 of these. So coming up, we have our next decade of music to go through. That'll take us up through 87. I know 87 presents some challenges because I've looked at it. Um, but anyway, let me know what you think. Keep those comments coming in. Keep, you know, keep doing what you do. And I'll keep doing what I do. I'm going to try to edit this one down and make it less than an hour long. We'll see if that happens or not. See you guys in 1977. Rock on.